Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, we have Matt uh, Lauricier. That's me. And uh, this is gonna be so fun, man. I mean, your background already tells the story. <laughs> um, so uh, you're host of the FUD Busters, um, and you are a big guns guy. So we're going to talk about the right to bear arms and also more specifically about what are called ghost guns and also printed 3D guns, um, which is insane to me uh, that anyone would advocate for that. So, so I got a bunch of them right here, so it looks yeah, like I you're in that. for a treat. I see that. <laughs> I don't want to presume what you believe about gun rights in America because there's significant nuance to that conversation. But what are your general thoughts about the right to bear arms in the United States? Well, I don't think there's any significant difference about the right to bear arms in the US versus anywhere else in the world. I think it's a core human right that flows from the right to self defense, which of course I define as the right to be secure from unlawful and illegal force against your body. I think it flows logically that we have the right to use whatever tools are necessary as to secure our, our bodies against unlawful force. And I think the purest way of acquiring those tools is to make them yourselves. Uh, and so that kind of flows perfectly well into the conversation we're about to have, I think. All right, so let me go ahead and challenge you on a couple of things. Um, you graduated cum laude from the University of Alabama. You have a JD degree and a master's of laws and tax, taxation. So you're a study guy, okay, uh, which I, I can definitely appreciate. Uh, when you say a right to self defense, that basically the right to bear arms is an extension of your right of self defense. Let me challenge that somewhat. The Constitution naturally grants us particular rights as human beings in America. Some of those rights you have based on birth, some of those rights you have or you grow into based on statute. For example, every person has. Um, the right of due process, no matter what. You're born into that right, you don't have to wait to turn a certain age to exercise that particular right. But in order to exercise the right to bear arms, every state statutorily, they make a determination of what age that should be. Which means if you're saying that the right to bear arms flows from the right of self defense, you have the right of self defense at the age of five, six, seven, eight, whatever, you have the right of self defense. But if you're saying that the right to bear arms and the right of self defense are basically one and the same or they flow from the same river, you would then have to make the intellectual argument that the right to bear arms should also be extended to anyone who has the right of self defense, which would in fact include a five year old child. Okay, well, so there's a lot to unpack there. And first of all, and you know, I'll, I'll do it nice and quick, but I think that you're conflating uh, the legal treatment of our rights in this particular country with the actual fundamental human rights. And the fact is, is that uh, I do think that the right to arms flows from that natural right to self defense. Does that mean that it hasn't been infringed for, you know, in the majority of the world for the majority of time? No, absolutely. And there's a lot of Supreme Court doctrine that says that your rights don't fully form until you become, you reach a certain age of maturity. And of course, that age is always arbitrary. It's an arbitrary line. Do I think that it's drawn correctly? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But I, I, I divorce the right to arms from the Constitution. Now, the Constitution recognizes, doesn't enshrine, but recognizes our pre existing right to arms. And so I just think those are important, you know, bits of nuance to make. I think that we have a natural core human right and that. Every person everywhere in the world has that right. And I think that pretty much everywhere in the world that those rights are very heavily infringed in a unjust manner. So let's talk about something else you said. You said basically a person should be able to utilize any tool necessary to defend themselves, right? So does that mean that you should be able to purchase any tool to defend yourself? Well, any tool that's appropriate for those means, I think yes. I think, and you know, people always go into, oh, well, what about nukes? And there's a a public well, nuisance. Just what about problem. grenades? Yeah, well, what you about grenades? Nukes. So there's a there's a public nuisance problem, right? That when you use a grenade, sometimes, you know, maybe if you live in the middle of Arizona, maybe there's an argument that you could effectively use a grenade in self defense. I don't know. I I'm not too interested in finding that out. Frankly, if we if we get to the point that that 
that's what we're having to fight on, then I think I'll, you know, I'll have succeeded in my career and I'll, you know, go write spy novels on the beach or something. But right now I'm trying to just keep everyone from tearing simple rifles out of our hands. So simple rifles, you know, nobody's debating that you do not have the right to bear arms. But with every right, you would agree to this as a trained jurist, every right has a responsibility connected. And because of that responsibility connected, there are regulations to that right. So let me give you an example. I know a lot of people call what I believe in gun control, and I really hate that terminology. Um, you believe in the freedom of speech, right? Of course. Okay. And that freedom, which is codified in the US Constitution, tells us that the government cannot infringe on my freedom of speech, religious expression, assembly, etc. Mm-hmm. But there are restrictions to that freedom. Um, I cannot use that freedom to harm other people, for example. I can be charged with a crime for, for, from the government. The government can restrict that behavior. So my freedom of speech has statutory restrictions. But nobody calls the statutory restriction to my freedom of speech, speech control. But when we have statutory restrictions, To the use of guns, the terminology is then gun control. But every right has statutory restriction, all of them. What's the issue with that? Why is that a problem? So does the fact that it's written in statute make it morally right? I mean, I'm sure you remember there was a lot of very bad stuff in this country that was considered to be good law for a very long time. And I'm sure you're extremely well aware that the origin of modern Gun control law. You know, I I'm interested in the the point you make there. I I definitely love to talk with you about that more later. Uh, but you know, the genesis of this stuff was particularly aimed at people of color and immigrants and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was uh, from in in my opinion, the very genesis of these laws is void and is completely without the uh, the scope of our constitution. I think that the, at the very genesis, the types of laws that people want to push now. Uh, should be void under you know, equal protection, under due process, under a lot of things aside from the Second Amendment. Uh, you know, and I think it's very important to have that backdrop. Like, I mean, I'm sure you're aware of New York Sullivan, Act, uh, Sullivan Law was only ever enforced against Italians. That kind of says something. The Supreme, I, I live in Florida. The Supreme Court of the state of Florida has recognized that the Reconstruction era gun control laws that were placed in Florida were only ever used to mm-hmm. disarm Black men. Yeah, okay. so let me let me give you some insight uh, to what you're saying because um, I intentionally do not participate in certain pro- programs. Uh, in my local community, uh, the sheriff knows me, the solicitor knows right. me, the mayor knows me. They have asked me to participate in what's called gun buyback programs from urban communities that I was raised in. My answer is no. I do not engage in disarming those hoods or those communities that I was raised in. I don't do that because y'all are not disarming. Do you understand what I'm saying? They're not telling you all or others who don't look like the community I came from to disarm. Um, So that's a different debate. When you say y'all, you mean like the police or do you mean? No, I mean individuals who are pro gun. Uh, individuals who are who are on the conservative side or conservative leaning in the ideology. Uh, Those the laws that you just talked about the 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 implementation um, has always been skewed because of the implicit bias, racism, etc. That's inside of our systems. Absolutely. So that's one thing you and I actually agree with, yeah. right? You, you're a conservative guy, or at least conservative leaning. Am um, I? Yeah, you got. Yeah, yeah, you. Are. I don't know about that, man. You don't think you are? All right, so you're conservative. <laughs> uh, yeah, at least you should, on this you should issue. read some of my writings. So. All right, so you're conservative. <laughs> let, let me say this: you're conservative on this issue, but you and I do completely agree on the issue of unfair uh, execution of legal statutes. We we agree on that 100%. Right. And on fair intent, I think you know I think that it's beyond execution. And if you look um, at the brief that was just filed in the Supreme Court state, the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association case on the half of the Black Defense Bar, they pointed out that almost all of the gun crime that people talk about, you know, this big spooky gun crime, is simple, peaceable possession of a firearm. And right. you know, I don't have to tell the audience who's 70% of the people that they prosecute for that exactly. simple, peaceable possession. You know, exactly. I don't even have to tell you, brother. Uh, Music to my ears. I research that as well, and and what they do is they they uh, itemize it as gun violations, mm-hmm. so that they can uh, promote the data where black people are the are the majority in that data, just for having a gun on them. 
Right. No one. And, it's, and who is it that's the most frequently the victim of violent crime? It's poor and minority Americans. And so I think it's you know really makes sense from a human rights perspective and from you know wanting to protect human life to say hey. We should be making guns as cheap and accessible as possible so okay, that these now. people who most need them can get them. You know, <laughs> I mean, maybe you, I lost you, 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 but. Yes, all right, now you're in the lion's den. Okay, that's fine. So this is the part where, where we completely disagree. That's okay. Uh, the Biden administration, and I wanna provide context for those who are watching. Uh, the Biden administration has directed the Department of Justice to propose a rule um, to stop the creation of what's called ghost guns. Now, these are literally 3D printed guns, guns you can make at home. But there, there are various ways to make guns. But literally, you could just print one yeah, and like it's these. a functional yeah. gun. You got some behind you, yeah. right? Now, I designed those ones. the genesis of it, the genesis of it is that these guns are untraceable. Um, and the reasoning behind the directive is because of the untraceable aspect of these weapons. 30% in some regions in the country, 30% of guns that are used in crimes are untraceable. Not because they're created, but because they have been wiped of the serial numbers, okay? Which creates the same de facto circumstance if you're able to create these guns as well. Do you not find it potentially problematic given the fact that in many regions up to 30% of violent crimes that are committed with guns are committed with guns that are non traceable. Do you not find it problematic when you invite in a way to create, to make, to print non traceable guns? You don't think criminals will take significant advantage of that and it does not warrant a statutory, a common sense statutory restriction? Uh, I mean, I, I wish you would have just asked the question instead of ask, adding more, you know, asterisk to it. But I mean, no, I, I don't think it's a real problem. And I think you actually hit on it. Um, and you know, I don't think that you have any bad intentions or that you're, you know, trying to be a gun grabber. I think it's awesome that you don't take part in those attempts to disarm black communities. I think it's really yep. principled that you take those stances. However, uh, I just want to point out that this whole traceability thing is a bunch of garbage. It's really a CSI misunderstanding, uh, an intentional misleading of how these things work. In fact, every single gun that was uh, made before 1968 is. De facto untraceable the way they're talking about it because the standardizations for serialization weren't set down until the Gun Control Act, right? Which again had very bad, very negative intentions. Uh, the vast majority of guns that are out there, after they trade hands privately two or three times, become as untraceable, and I'm using scare quotes here because I think it's a nonsense term. As any other gun, as a printed gun, as a gun you mill out of an 80, whatever. It, there is not a principled distinction between a 3D printed gun and a gun that came out of the factory and just has been on the market for 15 or more years. It, it There is just no practical difference. And that's because when these guns trade hands, guess what? The tracing system that they want you to believe, it, you know, they want you to believe that there's these psychics that can tell exactly where a gun is and and you know what the gun's criminal intent is. That only <laughs> that can only trace where the gun has been with a federally licensed dealer, and you know if if you want to then say okay well let's shoehorn everything into these federally licensed dealers right because that's where people go with the universal background checks. Well then you're in a situation exactly like it was with um, you know Florida in the post war period where suddenly again who's the people running the gun shops? Do you really want them to be the one and only gatekeeper of the right to? You know, protect your own life, or do you want it to be so that those people who are disadvantaged and who are at real risk of, of unlawful violence to be able to stay alive and to protect themselves? And I mean, we might disagree on how we get there, but I think we agree on the core principle. My answer is hell, get those people as many cheap printable gun parts kits as possible and let them be protected. Okay, let me read something to you um, about the tracing process. Uh, firearms tracing begins when a law enforcement agency discovers a firearm at a crime scene and wants to learn where it came from. The NTC receives the trace request and uses the gun serial number to identify its original manufacturer and or importer. From their records, NTC is able to track the firearm through the wholesale and resale distribution chain uh, to its first retail purchaser. So right. literally, law enforcement is able to trace the firearm with one piece of dynamic information. 
But you and just that, said it there yourself. The let, first let me, retail purchaser. Let, let, no, no, and let the me, data let me, they have, right? Let me, so pre-68. Well, brother, uh, <laughs> pre-1968, <laughs> wait, wait a minute. <laughs> it's gone, you can't trace it. Okay, <laughs> listen to me, brother. I got you, brother. The I, information I that I just read to you, you can find it real clear. It's ATF.gov. Do you know how many weapons you're you're a guns guy? Well, I, and I have a gun shop, so I've how responded many to ATF traces. I, I know how this works. I, I, I got your records. Well, and once if you, you know it, how it works, listen yeah. to me, brother. Got, got if you got. know how it works, you know good and damn well they can trace it based on serial numbers. No, they can't. They can trace it to the first retail purchaser. Let me okay? let me read this again. Let to me the first retail. No, you said it, the first retail purchaser. So what about after that? What about any gun that was sold? So let me. The let majority me of Glock, Glock Gen three, right? Read they were it sold more than five years ago. Because right? I don't think I don't think you heard me. I I did. Okay. Well, allow me to read it again and hopefully okay. you catch up on what it actually says. The NTC is able to track the firearm through wholesale, resale, resale distribution chain, all the way to its first. Retail purchaser. First what are you retail purchaser. About? So, and where that first retail purchaser is, so let me explain. The manufacturer, which we're a federally licensed manufacturer, puts mm-hmm. the gun in the bound book, okay? okay? Then when we sell the gun to a distributor, we log the gun out to the distributor. The distributor okay. logs it into the bound book. The distributor sells it to a local dealer, logs it out, local dealer logs it in. Mm-hmm. Local dealer sells it to the dude, logs it out to the dude. Mm-hmm. Dude no longer has any record keeping requirements and it would be impossible for them to do such. So dude sells gun. Dude maybe dies. Gun disappears. Anything happens, okay. like I'm saying. Anything so, so that's more I than the a year old. Arguing. I understand it's, the nuance you're gone. arguing. Okay, right. let me make let me make it clear. The nuance that you're arguing is that yes, you can actually trace a gun back to the person that purchased the weapon, but if they decide to sell it privately on the private market, there's no tracing uh, ability required. Now, here's the issue. Here's the problem with your analysis, brother. Uh, 42% of gun sales in the United States happen without the need for somebody to present an ID or to provide that kind of information, okay? Right. Um, okay, I, I, I disagree with that rule, uh, but I get it, that is a rule. So you're right on one very small part that a private gun seller can sell to somebody without the requirement of saying who they sold to. Here's why it's still important to know who got the gun in the first damn place. If somebody bought the gun from you and they decided to sell it to their neighbor, Neighbor goes out and commits a crime with the gun. Well, they come back to you. You say, this is the person I sold it to. Law enforcement goes to that person and they say, hey, I I no longer own that gun. My neighbor owns that gun, that person committed the murder. Now you have traced the gun based on one thing, the fact that it has a freaking serial number. Well, what about any gun that was made more than five years ago? What about okay. the vast and sweeping majority of guns that have been out there forever? Even when they go so back you're into commercial arguing distribution. the what aboutism of previously creating no, guns. No, what about the hundreds of point. millions of guns just, that just exist? Just listen to me, brother, to make your point matter. that it's a bad thing to be able to have serial numbers for guns. Is that what you're saying? Well, guns actually, not have no, I'm saying numbers? they're still traceable because, and they're still traceable the same way that we trace the other guns because of the way we log them into our A and D books. You log a gun without a serial number. That's because you, books. sir, you are a responsible gun seller. Okay, I can say that. I'm okay with saying but, that. No, the federal but, law but, says I have to do it. Right, because you're responsible to do it. Right, a federal law says you got to do what you got to right. do. It. I already have to log the, all these guns in, so the I don't fact, understand what it is you're advocating for, brother. This what I'm. This is what I'm bringing to your table, brother. If you can print damn guns, print them, right, without any restriction from the government, that is adversarial to what you do. That's different than what you do. No, it's not. There's a reporting mechanism for you. But there's, I'm a, a, there's a logging I'm a stupid mechanism gatekeeper for you. that is put here to increase costs. If the person can make their gun on their own, and again, it's illegal for them to do it for criminal purposes, it's illegal for them to do it for the purpose of resale. It's not going to be any more illegal to make a gun for criminal purchase purchases or purposes if you change the law. It doesn't change anything. The only thing that it would do is increase costs, and I think that's just going to hurt poor Americans. Yeah, Let so, just print their so I, I compl- brother, I completely disagree. That the only thing it does is increase costs. I think it actually in, increases carnage. But do you agree uh, it does? In, do you agree it increases costs? Uh, when it may, I don't know. I haven't researched that. But I do know having people with the ability to print guns will increase carnage and also increase the uh, chances that you can't find out who the hell committed the murder. I print guns uh, all the time, and they're very polite. 
Yeah, once again, man. Look at them. You're federally regulated. You can't compare yourself to somebody but could, but who decides to act in a criminal. All way. my friends do it. All their guns are polite and handsome. Are they are they acting in a criminal way against the federal guideline? No. All right, so the federal guideline. So why should we punish out. them? Should we punish so, me and my friends? Wait a minute, you can't commit murder either. That's not because you yeah. do commit murder. That's because uh, there's a law saying you should not commit murder. So it, here's the thing, if you're acting lawfully, you shouldn't care that there are additional restrictions for those who do not. You so if you're acting, acting lawfully, lawfully, should you be able to print a gun? Uh, if, you so. reg- if you register that gun and it's allowable to do so, that's fine. But there's uh, no federal gun registry for regular semi-automatic And damn it, it should be. Why? It should so, be. So that the government can track down everybody and go into those neighborhoods of people they don't like and disarm them? That sounds yeah. like not very cool. Yeah, I, I, I definitely get your point on that, brother. <laughs> I, I'm I mean, we've seen it happen. I, I, listen, listen, I, I understand I gotta go, you. I, I gotta think go. you're a good guy, but you know, I, I think it'll happen. You know, I, I do. And, and and you and you can live in that fear monger place. That's fine. I'm not I completely scared. Dis, I completely disagree with the assessment or the observation that that is what happens. I think it's common sense. If you have, especially if you're one of these guys that have 6,000 weapons, 150,000 rounds of ammunition, like I just reported about two weeks ago, uh, you need to be tracked. You need to be under surveillance. Somebody needs to be watching you. There needs to be a rule, a law, a statute to regulate that kind of behavior. Brother, I do have to go, man. I'm already flat over my time. But we'll bring you back and we'll debate um, after Joe Biden makes this new law, makes this new directive. We'll debate that, okay? I'll sue him. <laughs> that was the best comeback at the end of a bullpen, man. I'll let you have that one. And he'll be sued by a whole lot of people when it yep. happens. All Thank right. you for Thank having you me, bro. man. I appreciate it.